have you state your name. We're back on the okay. record on 2020 MM 1628. Go ahead and state your name, Ms. Chambers. Uh, Jocelyn Chambers for the state. Go ahead. Zara Umansky on behalf of Wolfgang Halbig, the petitioner in this cause, Your Honor. Thank you so much. And Mr. Halbig is present and sitting to your right. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. If we're here on your petition to expunge, you may proceed. Yes, Your Honor. As the court is aware, Mr. Halbig was given or uh, issued a certificate of eligibility from FDLE, which, as the court is aware, is then presumed to be entitled to relief to the expunction under Marcy's law, I believe. And this case was no cross. Um, although an information was filed, the state decided to dismiss this case and not pursue it further. The alleged victim of this alleged offense, um, the state said had an objection, and that is why this hearing was set. However, just minutes before we uh, started this hearing, the state um, provided me with documents that they intend to introduce them. So we just want to make the court aware that we were never given these documents before, and we would object to their introduction because we have not had a chance to review them or prepare any type of rebuttal to them. Okay. Uh, would you um, like to respond? Yes, Jocelyn Chambers for the state. Um, I received emails this morning um, from Mr. Posner that were forwarded to me from my victim advocate, who's also president of court. Um, these emails essentially, um, essentially the state's argument um, under Maxwell versus State is that the court um, can deny the expungement um, in your honor, it's your sole discretion to whether to deny it or grant the um, petition. And essentially, following the court in Maxwell versus State, 185 Southern 3rd 702, I do have a copy for the court. Can you uh, approach with a copy, please? Yes, Judge. Um, and I also have provided a copy with defense as well. Um, in that case, um, the defendant was found guilty at trial of neglect of an elderly or disabled adult. The verdict was ultimately reversed and vacated, and the defendant moved for an expungement. The court denied and said that the public should have a right to know about the appellant's arrest for her treatment of an elderly woman. Um, the defense appealed based on abuse, abuse of discretion standard, and the fourth DCA upheld it, um, said that the, it was a trial court's decision to deny expungement, and that the trial court's decision was sufficiently related to the facts and circumstances of the case. The emails that I received this morning um, that the victim is going to touch on a little when he gives his impact statement to the court um, are sufficiently related to the facts and circumstances in this case. Um, and I understand defense's objection is that they didn't have proper time to um, review them. I got them as well today. Um, I provided copies to defense. These are emails that the defendant has sent to Mr. Posner's attorney um, as early or as late as you know, July. I would object to the state making herself a witness and stating facts that are not on the record that who sent these emails, that's not facts and evidence. And I'm to that. Um, and judge, they're essentially from the email address that um, Mr. Wolfgang is known to use. You want to respect so, to that as well because uh, she's again not addressing the court. So my question to you yes. is: the, Are you trying to present evidence to the underlying charge that you dismissed? I am not, Your Honor. This this is not about the underlying charge. This is about the reason. Uh, essentially, the state's argument is that the public has the right to know. Um, essentially that he was arrested and prosecuted for this crime, even if it But he wasn't prosecuted. He dismissed it. He was prosecuted and information was filed. Correct. There is a, there is a, like a little difference. So it wasn't outright no, no information. Um, he was ultimately prosecuted and the state did ultimately file a no information notice. Um, and so the state's argument goes to that it's a public, the public has a right to know essentially what happened in this case. The reason additionally for the the request that it be denied, as you will hear from the victim, is that this is continued harassment even after the date um, that the no information was no, uh, was entered. Um, and so that's part of the argument. Okay. okay. Do you want to present any evidence or any yes, other? Your Honor, we have evidence to present, but I don't know if the state was talking about or gave the court a copy of the Maxwell case they're relying on, if the court wants us to wait to address that. I, I have it. 
Um, Your Honor, I would just, if the court wants us to wait, we can, but I would just distinguish this case. This case, just reading it very quickly, says that the case went to a trial. Correct. And then the charge was overturned. So that's completely factually different than our case and distinguishable. Okay. It can, it's like apples and oranges. There was no evidence presented in this case to a court against Mr. Halbig. Um, yes, Your Honor, I, um, since I don't know how the court wants to proceed, if the court wants to proceed with Mr. Posner, since he, under Marcy's law, wanted to be heard today, and then mm -hmm. Mr. Halbig can testify after. Ms. Chambers, do you have any objection to that? Um, Your Honor, because it's the defense's motion, I would ask okay. that defense make a statement first. Um, okay. And then. Okay. And then we'll so call your. Mr. Do you want to You can. You, you guys can stay there. You okay. can stay at your yeah. seat. It just. You can either stand at the podium or you can stay at the council's you table. Stay at council's? Is it better, easier for you? Sure. Okay. Go ahead and stand so this clerk can stand. Uh, swear you in. Okay. Stand up, Mr. Halbert. So you can swear it in. Do you saw me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may be seated. And please state your name, Mr. Mansky. Your Honor, may I sit down? You may. Should I? No, you don't need to touch that. Okay. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Wolfgang W. Halbig, H-A-L-B-I-G. And what is your date of birth? 8-10-1946. And Mr. Halbig, just so the court understands, are you a little bit hard of hearing? Yes, I am. Okay. If I say something that you don't hear, make sure you let me know. Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay. And I know this is a long, drawn-out, uh, I don't know if we could call it relationship, between you and Mr. Posner. I know the court does not have the time or wants to hear about what's happened over the last eight years or so. I agree. Um, let's just give the court a little bit of background information so that the court can understand what happened. Okay. Um, Prior to, were you a former law enforcement officer? I was a Florida State Trooper from 1970 through 1973. Okay, and then subsequent to that, did you start to work as a school administrator? Yes, I was a school uh, principal, assistant principal, Lake Mary, Lyman High School, Lake Brantley High School. I spent my, most of my life being a school administrator and teacher. Coach. Okay, would that have been about 25, 30 years? Yes. Your, job? Yes. Okay. And subsequent to that, did you then start doing work as an expert? Yes. In 1999, three school administrators from uh, Seminole County, we started a company called the National School Safety Institute, and we provided school safety training for public schools all, all across the country. Okay. And once you created this company, were you hired by different school districts across the country to give presentations about school safety? Yes, I was actually the school safety consultant for 47 out of 67 counties in Florida. I also got contracted by the United States Department of Justice to train over 3,500 school police officers and active shooter. I've also was contracted by the United States Department of Education to review federal safe school grants in helping them score those grants and awarding millions of dollars to school districts. Okay, now let's fast forward to approximately sometime in 2012, 13, you may have to tell the court the year, you were hired by the Tampa School Board to, to do what as far as the Sandy Hook shooting? Sandy Hook unfolded, and about four months after that, I got a phone call from the Tampa, uh, from Tampa, uh, from the Florida School Board Association, saying, Mr. Halbig, we'd like you to come back and do a presentation on what took place at Sandy Hook so we don't have a Sandy Hook in our school district or our community. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll check it out. This would have been my fourth presentation Columbine, Jonesboro, uh, Bethel, Alaska. Every time there's a tragedy, the school board asked me to come and do a presentation and provide them recommendations on what they could do okay. to not have a school shooting. In response to that, did you begin to do an investigation of the Sandy Hook shooting? Yes. And, and did, 
and let me just ask mm -hmm. you some questions to keep it going. And did you then start contacting law enforcement, school officials in the state of Connecticut to get information? Yes. And as a national school safety consultant, Your Honor, we, we train active shooter response. There are four distinct time periods in a school shooting. But wait a minute. I don't know if the judge does not need to hear that. So let's yeah, I don't need to that. have that in depth. Yeah, we don't need to hear that. Let me, let me, okay. Okay. so you started doing your investigation and at some point during your investigation, you hit roadblocks and were not given information even though you made public records requests? Right. Okay. Is that correct? They were simple requests, not intrusive to any parent whatsoever. You know, very simple public record requests that anybody should be able to get and not have a difficulty in getting them. Okay, and then at some point, Mr. Posner called you, somebody provided him with your information and said, this guy is nosing around and he called you, and that is the first time you had contact with Mr. Posner. Right. Mr. Posner called me, I mean, emailed me at my home saying he'd like to have a, a discussion. I did not respond to his uh, email or phone, trying to have a phone conversation. Approximately what year was that? Uh, I would say 2013. So is it fair to say since 2013 till now, there's been animosity between you and him and continuing things. Not me against him because I don't know who he is. I've never spoken to him. I've never, he tried to come to my gated community in Sorrento and I did not let him come in. I think he must have got mad about that for me not letting him come in and meet with me. Okay. Yeah. And then at some Point, there was a complaint filed against you with the Florida Attorney General's Office by Mr. Posner. Is that correct? That's correct. He filed in a, in a complaint stating that I was committing possible fraud and taking donors' money. And so I requested from the Attorney General, Pam Bondi, a copy of his email under public records, and I received it within four days. Okay. And sure enough, it was him writing the Attorney General accusing me of possible committing fraud. And also, since that time, Mr. Posner has also sued you in federal court as well. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Posner filed a civil lawsuit against me. Uh, and throughout the two years of that civil lawsuit, his attorney demanded that I pay them $10,000 uh, and they'll drop the lawsuit. And I did not pay, but they still dropped the civil lawsuit when Judge Briggs ordered a video deposition and Mr. Posner refused to show up. Okay, so now let's talk about what happened in this situation. You were then accused of unlawful possession of his personal information, is that correct? That's correct. And you were falsely accused of something that you did not do, is that correct? Absolutely. And because of his accusation, you were arrested by the Lake County Sheriff's Office and somehow, once you were arrested, someone put in the system that you were arrested for a felony instead of a misdemeanor. Is that right? Yeah, but the miscommunication is, it's not the clerk of the court putting it in the system. It's actually Deputy Corey Wingo, who's the arresting officer. He's the warrant deputy. He shouted out, I have a felony arrest warrant. Are you Wolfgang Halbig? I said, yes. They snatched me from my front door. Okay, now I just wanted, so let's try to narrow it down to so yeah. the court can understand. Since that day of that arrest, how has that impacted your life? It has destroyed my reputation as a national school safety consultant, as a national school safety expert, hired by attorneys all across the country. Were you able to work after that? No, I, nobody would touch me because I'm listed as a felon. And your honor, to this day, there is no felony affidavit for probable cause. There is no felony arrest warrant. So how do I become a felon when they're violating the Fourth Amendment due process? There is no Sir, felony. I, okay. You need to okay. answer your so, I'm sorry. attorney's I'm sorry. question. Okay. So let's just talk about the arrest. The arrest caused your photograph to be placed online, caused your family 
stress. Tell the judge how did this arrest and this case negatively impact you? Your Honor, within four hours after my arrest, my name was published in every national newspaper across the country as being a felon and had the disparaging articles that went with it. It destroyed my business called Children's Safety Institute, helping children with autism. Your Honor, it destroyed my 38 years. And that's why I'm asking your help today in getting an expungement. And I know that expunging cannot get it back for you. Absolutely. But what is an expungement going to do for you? Can you ask the judge how expunging this record is going to? I have four grandchildren. I want them to be proud of me. I do not want them ever to see that I'm a felon. I'm an honorable state trooper, customs agent, school administrator. I want to get my life back as best as possible. And yes, I still get requests to do consulting work, but when they find out that I'm a felon, I get nothing. I'm 77 years old. I have a lot to offer, and I can't work because I'm a felon. And prior to this arrest, had you ever been in trouble with the law before? Never. I, I am the law. I was the law. I've never been in trouble. Okay. And subsequent to this arrest, have you ever been in trouble with the law before? Absolutely not. So is this the only case, that only arrest on your record ever? Absolutely. And this is a case that was dismissed by the state? Yes, it was. Is there anything else you want to tell the judge? And, Your Honor, what really is disappointing to me as a former state trooper, they dropped the charges because I was reporting a crime to law enforcement. And the state attorney, uh, Moody, in her policy and procedures to clearly state that when someone makes a criminal complaint to law enforcement, it must be thoroughly investigated. Your Honor, the state made no effort to investigate my criminal complaint. The Lake County Sheriff made no effort. Okay, just to make the court understand, yeah. and we don't have to get into right. it, but you were filing a criminal complaint against Mr. Posner. Mr. Posner, time, right. And that is why you had allegedly his identifying information. Is that right, correct? Right, right. Okay. Is there anything else you want to tell the court? No, I, uh, I got Mr. Posner's information from my attorney, Caleb Payne, because we, did, we didn't know who Mr. Posner was, so we did a background search, okay. and it shows that he's using somebody else's Social Security number, so I reported it, and I thought I was doing my due diligence. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Halbeck. Ms. Chambers, would you like to cross? Yes. Um, you said that you've never had contact with Mr. Posner? Never. No contact ever. Not verbally. Okay. That's, I want to make sure you answer the question. Don't interrupt. Um, and you said that um, Mr. Posner accused you of... Um, committing fraud and taking donors' money? <clears throat> yes, he filed a complaint with uh, Pam Bondi, the Attorney General, uh, claiming that I was somehow taking money illegally, and I was actually investigated by the Attorney General's office, and they found no wrongdoing, and I asked him, how in the world did you guys get to my house? They said, well, somebody filed a complaint. I said, who did it? We can't tell you. You need to file a public record, and that's how I found out. Um, is this related to your fund that you made uh, GoFundMe versus on uh, about Sandy Hook? I, I didn't hear. Did you make a Sandy Hook GoFundMe? GoFundMe? Yes. Yes, there was an account established called GoFundMe, and that was to help some public records requests, and that's going to Connecticut uh, for court hearings. Okay. Um, you, have you heard of the phrase Sandy Hook denier? Have you heard of the, I apologize. Um, have you heard of the phrase, um, a Sandy Hook denier? Sandy Hook denier? Yes. When I did work for the Florida School Boards, I never heard the word conspiracy theorist. I never heard the word denier. I mean, I asked simple questions and I was attacked unbelievably. 
you appeared on InfoWars, is that correct? I was asked to be on InfoWars, yes. And that's with Alex Jones? Uh, it was with David Knight. Judge, I'm going to object. To, it's outside the scope of my direct, and I don't see how the, what the relevancy is. Your Honor, he indicated that because of this arrest, um, his reputation has been ruined as it relates to his um, ability to be a school safety consultant for the state of Florida. Um, the fact that he's appeared on InfoWars would also lead to that same conclusion. Judge, I would object and say that's our opinion, that's the state's opinion, and there's many people who might think InfoWars is a great thing to be on. Maybe Ms. Chambers doesn't, but how do we know that? But I don't see how that's well, relevant. It's going to be the court that makes the determination. I'm going to overrule your objection. Um, so you appeared on InfoWars multiple times? Uh, I believe no more than three times or four times. And as a result of that, you've raised money? Money? Correct. No. It was simply to, ask, to answer questions. About Sandy Hook? That Alice Jones had. Okay. And did you talk about Mr. Posner on these podcasts? No. Now, you have, um, even in today, um, in your conversations um, that were overheard, you mentioned that Mr. Posner is not who he says he is? Judge, I'm going to object. Is the state making herself a witness in this case? Sustained. Ask the direct question. Do you believe that Mr. Posner, as he says today, is Mr. Posner, father of Noah from the Sandy Hook shooting? Yes, I believe he is. And have you been emailing his attorney, Jake Zimmerman, um, documentation that he is not who he says he is? Yes. Judge, I'm going to mm -hmm. object again as far as relevancy and outside the scope of my direct. You want to respond, Ms. Chambers? Judge, it goes to the state's argument for denial um, in that he's indicating again that this has never happened to him before. It's, he's ruined his reputation that he was falsely accused. So what does the allegation that Mr. Halvig making the claim that Mr. Posner is not who he says he is have to relate back to this case than this petition? I yes, Judge. It goes to the initial um, allegations in the case um, that Your Honor can see from the state's statement of particulars as well as the PC affidavit um, were that he provided the victim's contact information, meaning his um, social security number um, and emails to multiple parties. Um, and essentially he's doing the same thing. He's just not using a social security number. So you're trying to allege that he's committing a crime now? No, it's not a crime that he's doing the same sort of harassment by using the victim's identifying information, this time photographs of himself, um, photographs of the victim. Of Mr. Posner? Correct. Okay. But, uh, Judge, um, the pictures and the emails that the state showed me were not even directed to Mr. Posner. They were directed to a third party. I don't know how... That's what she asked about. Right, but what I'm saying attorney. is I don't know how that's related to the alleged victim saying, I'm being harassed. That's like someone who's stalking someone else and other per third party saying, I feel stalked because you're stalking this third party. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. I'm going to sustain the objection. Chambers, do you have anything further? Um, yes, Judge. Are you um, still in possession of confidential um, images taken from a deposition? 
Judge, I'm going to object. I don't see the relevancy again of this question as well as how it pertains to what Mr. Halbig has testified to. Sustained. So he has no further questions. Okay. Any redirect? Brief? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else you'd like to call? Yes, yeah, the state would like to call oh, Mr. I'm asking. Oh, mm -hmm. I apologize. Oh, no, yeah, it's okay. Nobody else? Okay. No, Ms. Chambers. Yes, Judge. Uh, the state would like to call Mr. Posner. Mr. Posner, if you could come forward. You can either stand at the podium or you can take a seat in the witness stand. It's wherever you are more comfortable. Um, yeah, the is okay, that's fine. If you could face the clerk. If you could face the clerk and raise your right hand. I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Thank you. I do. Ms. Chambers, you may proceed. Um, Mr. Posner, did you prepare a impact statement for court today? I did. Um, and would you like to read that to the court? Yes, I would. Please. You may proceed. Okay. Um, I would like uh, to thank you for the opportunity you've given me to address the offenses Wolfgang Halbig has committed. For nearly 10 years, Halbig has led a terror campaign harassing families who've lost loved ones in the Sandy Hook school shooting. My son Noah was the youngest victim of that massacre and my two daughters, who were only feet away from being murdered, are amongst the survivors. Halbig has further traumatized my daughters and devastated their mother. His persecution of me has been debilitating, both robbing me of my ability to properly grieve for my baby and preventing me from having peace even to this day. I, I intend to use my full time addressing you today because I've learned there is little legal recourse when people like Halbig, whose numbers are growing every day, target vulnerable people for internet driven abuse. Consequently, this is my sole opportunity within the legal system of our state to fully describe the hell Halbig has put us through. Before I address the impact of this man's behavior, I want to remind everyone of one thing. Wolfgang Halbig presents himself as a harmless, wide-eyed senior citizen who is just asking questions. But bad people, liars, harassers, thieves, abusers, terrorizers, don't become virtuous or innocuous as they age. Behind Halbig's grandfatherly demeanor is a cruel man who continues to this day to harm the memory of my murdered son, endanger the lives of my teenage daughters, and actively recruit and inspire others to seek out and harm my children's mother and myself. Not because he is confused or because he's just wondered what happened in Connecticut. He seems to delight in hurting my family and other families that devastated by the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School. He does this for fame, prestige, and money. His decade-long campaign of harassment has made him infamous among the families, educators, and residents of Newtown, where the state of Connecticut has put a legal stop to his abuse of public record laws, and where his visits are monitored by police. Not long after the murder of my son and his schoolmates in 2012, Halbig realized he could solicit do donations from paranoid and easily misled individuals by spinning a fantasy tale that the shooting never happened. He presented himself as a former law enforcement and school safety expert, perfectly and uniquely positioned to dig into the case. In fact, he tried to convince Newtown officials to hire him as an investigator. When that effort failed, he changed tactics, accusing the government of staging the shooting to rob Americans of their Second Amendment and falsely promising his investigation would reveal the truth about dark forces manipulating the country. Halbig tells people a story in which I am a government agent. He tells them, my son was not real. My ex-wife, Veronique, was not my real wife. 
instead of a grieving father whose son was killed in a horrific tragedy, Halbig made me out to be a criminal traitor and a member of an international Jewish conspiracy to control the world. For the past 10 years, Halbig has sold his lies wherever he could. He solicited funds and made dozens of appearances on notorious conspiracy theorist shows such as Alex Jones's media network InfoWars, which has an average monthly audience of 10 million. By his own account, Halbig has raised more than $100,000 online to fund his bogus quest for Sandy Hook truth. In fact, after one appearance on InfoWars, Halbig has raised more than $22,000. To explain the incredible power of that relationship, I would like to read a portion of a New York Times article entitled, How Alex Jones and InfoWars Helped a Florida Man Torment Sandy Hook Families. Judge, I'm going to object to this since he's referencing a media source. And, you know, this is not facts and evidence. This is supposed to be a victim impact statement, so I don't know how a news article goes towards a victim impact statement. Okay. Um, Response? Your Honor, this is part of his impact statement. This, the article that he's referencing is about Mr. Um, Posner um, and about the defendant as well. Um, additionally, Your Honor, this, we're not in front of a jury. Um, Your Honor can discern whether you know, it's relevant or not or whether you're going to consider it. Um, but I would ask that the victim's impact statement per Marcy's law not be limited. This isn't a capital case. Uh, can continue. Thank you. Over several years, Mr. J Jones gave Mr. Halbig's view an audience by inviting him to be a guest on InfoWars, his radio and online show. InfoWars gave Mr. Halbig a camera crew and a platform for fundraising, even as Mr. Halbig repeatedly visited Newtown, demanding thousands of pages of public records including photos of the murder scene, the children's bodies, and receipts for the cleanup of bodily fluids, and brain matter, and skull fragments, and about 40 to 60 gallons of blood. Given practical support and visibility by Mr. Jones, Mr. Halbig hounded families and the victims of other residents of Newtown. Mr. Halbig displays a folksy affect and frequently says that as soon as his demands for information are met, he can b get back to his life with his grandchildren. But when unsuccessful in getting that information he is seeking, Mr. Halbig publishes the personal information of his targets, spurring torrents of abuse and threats. That article details just a small fraction of the abuse Halbig has piled up against the families of victims. He has posted photos of living Newtown children online, accusing them of being murdered children still alive and hiding, and repeatedly named a specific girl, expo exposing her family to abuse. He has sent thousands of harassing and frightening emails to Sandy Hook families, insisting their children are alive and promising to dig up their graves and take their parents to court for lying about their murders. He has made more than two dozen trips to Newtown to personally harass families and residents. The Catholic Diocese of Bridgeport sent him an official letter banning him from the campus of St. Rose of Lima, where seven victims' funerals were held. After he and an InfoWars camera crew filmed young children leaving the parish school, Sadly, one of the parents of a murdered girl in Newtown who Halbig repeatedly tormented publicly committed suicide. Today I'd like to address the terror Halbig has caused me, Noah's mother and sisters, and the pain and fear he inflicted on us, maliciously and without decency or remorse. As we tried together to pick up the pieces of our shattered family and figure out how to live in a world without Noah. Thanks in part to Alex Jones and InfoWars promotion, funding, and amplification of his hate, 
Halbig gleefully encouraged the development of an internet community of tens of thousands of Sandy Hook hoaxers, fueled by Halbig's claims of a government hoax, because I spent years working to stop the spread of this ridiculous conspiracy theory about my son's murder, Halbig direct, directed this warped community hate at me. Initially, I tried to reason with the man, which did not work. I naively hoped that by direct contact, he could ask questions and maybe stop his attacks, if he knew that there was a real person on the other end of his targeting, Never spoken and that he was hurting people. In response, I received an email stating he would not talk to me until I exhumed my son's body and proved that he existed. When it was clear no amount of logic or reasoning would convince him, I turned to the social media platforms he was using to harass us for help. I complained to tech companies and submitted countless requests to social media companies. I had some limited success, but none of it was stopping him. This only caused Halbig to fixate on me, carry a vendetta against me, and relentlessly harass and cyberstalk me. Over the years, Halbig's fixation became so intense, he retaliated against me by having an attorney secure a copy of a comprehensive background report on me, my family containing my social security number, address, financial history, medical history, education, all of my assets, much more in the same history for 56 of my relatives, which Halvig then openly disseminated to thousands. Once he had that report, he traded it amongst other conspiracy theorists, passed it out as a bonus for those who would contribute money to his cause, give it out as a prize to people who would help him engage and harass me, and posted those details online. He provided my private personal information and the details of my family to thousands, some with criminal records, some with a history of violence, and some who were clearly mentally ill. Some of those recipients had conspiracy theory YouTube channels and spread our personal information further and resulted in death threats. Think about that for a moment. It's like the plot of a Hollywood psychological horror film, where after victimizing me for years, Halbig was so angry that I attempted to protect myself and my family, he essentially put out a hit on us, giving other monsters all of my entire family's sensitive information. I've had to go to extraordinary lengths to protect myself from identity theft. I continue to get regular death threats. One of Halbig's research assistants, currently incarcerated for attempted murder, called me and recited my address and social security number along with his threat. It's impossible to get my private information back from these people. I can't protect my family. I've had to go to ex the extreme of being accepted into, into the Florida Address Confidentiality Program with the Florida State Attorney General. The arrest that Halbig seeks to seal is the lone evidence in this jurisdiction of the horrendous actions he has taken against me. The sheer audacity Halbig exhibits now attempting to seal his record when for years he purposely and maliciously exposed mine is, is, is outrageous. I've been forced to move more than a half a dozen times due to Halbig's intentional release of my personal information and that of my family. The expense and stress of continually having to move, the dread of this constant harassment and the stalking, the sense of never feeling safe, all while suffering from diagnosed PTSD have taken a brutal toll on me and my family. Of course, I've tried to do something about how big's lies and harassment. In addition to working with online companies, I started reporting him to police and took him to court. The response of police prosecutors ranged from apathetic to sympathetic, but they were all confused as to what they could legally do about an online abuser and predator like Halbig. I was pleased when Lake County took action against Halbig. I, under, I understand the internet and this new world we live in 
have made these kinds of charges difficult, and I accept that Halbig will not be punished for these crimes. But I do not accept that Halbig's history with law enforcement will be scrubbed from, pub from the public record entirely. Halbig appeals to the court to seal his arrest and persecution record, and prosecution record. He doesn't want anyone to know about his personal business, a position I find staggering considering he has spent the past decade injecting himself into the private pain and private lives of so many victims for fame and for fortune. But this isn't a man who is remorseful for a momentary lapse in judgment. Halbig's cruel actions have not ceased. Even today, he routinely sends electronic communication to various law firms, media organizations, government agencies, conspiracy theorists, and many others, and each email is designed to continue his campaign against me and further inflame his followers' obsession with my life. For example, on June 16th of 2023, he sent an email to more than 30 recipients, including pictures of me claiming I am an imposter. That was followed by an email on July 5th of 2023 that contained more pictures and implied that I am Jewish, I rape babies. Another email on July 15th of 2023, which was sent to more than 70 recipients, argued that I committed a crime by engaging in fraud on the court. All of this and more happened while Halbig is seeking to have his record expunged while claiming to be an innocent senior citizen. I was hope, hopeful when Halbig was arrested for possessing and disseminating my personal and private information. I felt his disgusting campaign might be coming to an end, but today I have a new worry. Halbig seeks to have his court erase any record of the details of his arrest and prosecution. I do not know the legal standards for which those are applied in his request. Still, after being harassed by this man for over a decade, I do know this. If records of Halbig's arrest are hidden from public view per his request, he will interpret that outcome as an endorsement for his conduct. His fixation on me will intensify, as will his belief he can act with, it, with impunity. I beg the court not to grant this cruel man any indulgences or privileges, especially when such an action is certain to impact my life and the lives of my family in a severely negative way. I was once asked by a reporter about my life about after my son became the youngest victim of the Sandy Hook school shooting. Noah had just turned six. He was a happy first grader who had just lost his first tooth. And with his twin sister, had just had his sixth birthday. I told the reporter December 14th was the single worst day of my life. And every day thereafter was a close second. This is a wound that will never heal. Wolfgang Halbig is a cruel, sadistic, malevolent force who has purposely and maliciously contributed to reopening that wound, making every day after Noah's murder a close second. Please send a message to Mr. Halbig and the thousands of predators like him on the internet. <coughs> Please do not conceal what this man has done from public view. Please. Do not conceal what this man continues to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, you can be seated. Um, Your Honor, if I could... Uh, you have a question? Yes, I do. Sir, Mr. Pauser, come Go back. Ahead. Sorry. Okay. Your Honor, should I have this marked by the clerk? I'm going to... I approach. Are you just admitting it? Are you going to try to admit it into evidence, or are you? Well, I wanted to, to show it I, for the court to see it. Okay. And Judge, I'm going to object to relevancy as far as the, it's an email that purports that Mr. Posner has sent to, and I, I apologize, I didn't. To Mr. Halbig, a photograph of Mr. Halbig telling him he needs to lose weight. 
Right. I'm not sure how that's relevant to a motion to seal or expunge. Your Honor, he just testified about harassment that he feels he has faced, and we we're just so trying to show. I'll let you lay the foundation of of that. Okay. Mr. Posner, I'm handing you what will be eventually couldn't be marked as an exhibit okay. by the clerk. Do you recognize this? Um, no. This is a photo from an interview that Halbig did from a, uh, a documentary or a photo or something. Is your email lposner at gmail.com? Yes. Okay. Did you send this email with this photograph to Mr. I don't recall Halbig? sending that. Okay. Do you recall sending this email telling him, and you know you're under oath today, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. That you need to lose weight. Yeah, I don't recall sending that. But it's possible you sent it, is that correct? It would be possible, yes. Okay. But it you just looks don't... like it has my name on it, yes. Right. So it's possible it's your email, but today, standing here today, you don't remember I it. don't recall that, no. Okay. So is it fair to say that you may have sent some, like, not-so-nice emails back to Mr. Halvig as well? Do you have the things, email that Halvig had sent prior to that? Is that a reply? I'm not sure what you're referring to. No, we're just addressing what you sent to Mr. Halvig, that you sent him an email telling him that he needs to lose weight. In and response to something? I don't know, but that, right now what I'm saying is, is it fair to say that you sent some emails to him that might not have been as con very kind either? I'm not sure what your question is. Okay. Your Honor, can the court direct the witness to answer my question? He doesn't seem to understand. He didn't have any problems I'm understanding. Saying that he, so, sir, Mr. Mansky, go ahead and rephrase your question. So, did you send Mr. Halbig emails commenting on his weight? I do not recall sending Mr. Halbig that email. I sent Mr. Halbig one email asking him to speak with him. I never originated a new email to Halbig. Okay. Maybe not originated, but is it possible that this was a reply from you as a continuation of an email to Mr. Halbig stating that he I may have replied to an email Mr. Okay. Halbig sent. And in an email, you reference a photograph of him depicting him. Is that correct? I do not recall doing that. Okay. And isn't it true that you've never spoken? Mr. Halbig has never spoken to you. Is that correct? Mr. Halbig called me several times and left several voicemails. But that's not my question, Mr. Posner. My question was, you have never spoken to Mr. Halbig. I have not. Okay. I want to make sure that is clear. You have never verbally right. had any and conversation. and I have never gone to his house, as he okay. seems to claim hundreds of times. And Mr. Posner, these emails that you're telling the court about that allegedly occurred from June of this year to July of this year that you said were sent allegedly to 70 or more people, you were never one of those people. Is that correct? They were sent to my attorney. And that is not my question, I'm Mr. Posner. Your Honor, I'm going to ask Sir, the court you to need to answer the gentleman. question. I'll give the state an opportunity to cross-examine you or ask you some questions based on Ms. Umansky. So you need to answer her question that she asked. Whether you like the answer or not, you must answer it. Okay? My question to you was, sir, that you testified under oath here today that Mr. Halbig allegedly sent emails starting in June of 2023 to 70 or more recipients, right. several emails, but not you were not a single one of those recipients. Is that correct? Yes, I'm the subject of the email, but that, they were not sent to me. Okay, so you were not one of the recipients. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. I have no further questions. Ms. Chambers, would you like to make recross or um, The emails that you were just referencing, those were sent to your attorney? Is that yes. correct? Um, and that his name is Jake Zimmerman? Yes. Um, and the subject of those emails was what? I don't have them in front of me. And by subject, I don't mean subject line, but what were the emails Oh, they're about? all about me. They're photos of me and conspiracy theories about me and all kinds of odd ideas. About how you are not who you say you are. Right. And those were weeks just... Uh, the most recent being July 15th? Yes. I need to get a on speech. Okay. And does Mr. Um, Zimmerman actively represent you? He does. And he forwarded you those emails once he received them? Yes. Okay. No further questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. You may be seated.
Ms. Chambers, do you have any other people, any other witnesses that you would like to call? No, Your Honor, the state has no more, um, I still no want other to come here to speak. Ms. Umansky, would you like to make any argument? Yes, Your Honor, we do, but Your Honor, we just want to know if we can have a copy of the victim impact statement. The state never provided us with one. Um, Your Honor, it's my victim's impact statement. He made it on the record to the court. It was not filed with the court, so. Okay, as long as it wasn't filed with the court. We just want to make sure. No, it was not. Um, Your Honor, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things going on here today, and we've got to separate them out. I, I'm not denying what Mr. Posner went through. I don't know Mr. Posner. I'm sure the court doesn't know Mr. Posner, and it's very unfortunate what he went through. But we have to focus on what Mr. Halbig was accused of and what happened in this case. In this case, he was accused of a statute that's a misdemeanor saying unlawful possession of personal identifying information of an individual. But he didn't commit a crime. And that's the problem, and that's why the state dismissed the charge. He should have never been arrested. Mr. Posner started a criminal case against him that the state picked up saying, he has my information and he shouldn't have it, and the state filed, but Mr. Posner had that information. It wasn't unlawful for him to have it. If you recall the testimony, he got that information publicly through the Attorney General's office. So that's why the state dismissed the case, because what he allegedly did with this information was not unlawful. So, Your Honor, going back to the very beginning of this case, he should have never been arrested. He should have never been charged. But it gets worse from there. The state had him arrested for what should have been a misdemeanor, but through an error on the arresting officers, um, the one who executed the warrant, put it in as a felony. So he created a CF case number in the system, said he was charged with a felony, and then everything started going downhill with Mr. Halbeck. This is not about whether or not the court thinks He's a saint, a good person, and Mr. Posner is a bad person, a good person. That is not what the court is here to decide. Who is a good person, who is a bad person? We're asking the court to follow the law. And the law says this was an arrest that shouldn't have happened. And every, and this is why we live in this country, there's First Amendment rights. Some of us do not like them. Some of us do not want people to speak their minds and have their opinion. And unfortunately to Mr. Posner, he may not like what's written about him, said about him. And I understand that. But you know what? That's what's so great about this country, that you get to speak your mind, as long as it doesn't violate the law. And going back to this case, Your Honor, we have put good cause and testimony on Going back to what the law says, the law says Mr. Halbig is presumed to be entitled to the expunction based on that certificate of eligibility unless the court can find facts, facts that he should not be. And the case that the state has cited, the uh, Maxwell case, is 100% not on point and distinguishable. That is a case where the court heard facts, evidence, but then the conviction was overturned. That is not here today. There's nothing other than things that Mr. Halbig has allegedly done that Mr. Posner does not like. And if you heard my cross-examination, Mr. Posner admitted today under oath that he has never spoken to Mr. Halbig. And those emails that were allegedly sent were never sent to him. And Your Honor, in light of what was heard today, we feel we have shown good cause to this court that this expunction should be granted. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, pursuant to 943-0584, subsection 4E, um, the expungement statute does not confer any right to the expungement of any criminal record and any request for the expungement of a criminal record may be denied at the sole discretion of the court. Um, we would just ask that, and I understand the facts in Maxwell, there is no facts um, directly on point as far as conspiracy theories or, um, you know, deniers of mass shootings. Um, 
there is nothing on point as far as that. The reason why I cited the Maxwell case is because um, it was the case that I found that was based on the public having a right to know about the arrest. Um, and yes, the state ultimately did file a null process on this case on April 7th, 2021. That null process was filed um, with the court. Based on what you've heard today, uh, we would ask Your Honor to deny the defendant's petition to expunge. Um, there's continued harassment by the victim in this case. Um, and I understand that he, Mr. Um, Halberg has not spoken to the Mr. Posner um, and that the emails were directed to Mr. Posner's attorney. However, based on that conduct, um, Mr. Posner is continuing to be harassed not only by you know followers of Mr. Halbig, um, but they've caught continued harassment of Mr. Uh, Posner as well as people who are similar situated as him. Um, and so it's in your honor's sole discretion of the court um, based on the facts and circumstances of this court, uh, we would ask that your honor deny the motion to, or the petition to expunge. At this time, I'm going to deny the motion or the petition to expunge based on the interest of the public. The court does feel like it is relevant that the um, defendant has continued to email and reach out to numerous, numerous people with regards to the alleged victim, Mr. Posner, in this case. Furthermore, he indicates that he is in the business of consulting with regards to school shootings. However, the sole basis of the uh, underlying charge was with regards to the alleged victim, Mr. Posner, um, being a fraud and lying about uh, his child being a victim of the Sandy Hook shooting. It is relevant to the public and is of public interest. Therefore, I am denying the petition to expunge. Um, Your Honor, I would ask one further thing. Um, my, can you just ask the defendant to hold back just so that Mr. Posner can get to his car? Uh, yes, I'll allow. A, a reasonable amount of time. I'm not asking for hours. It's just no, I'll, I'll allow five minutes to get to his car. Next.